Mike Riley Now podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. Follow us by visiting MikeRileyNow.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And welcome one and all to the Mike Riley Now podcast here on the Young Angels of America Network. I am your host, of course, Mr. Mike Riley, and I am joined. Welcome back, my lovely co-host Cam Robson and my girl Charlie Sandy. Hello, hello, welcome back from finals. And we also have some uh some some live audience members tonight. At least one. We have my man um Carrie Otis. I know, I got you. <laughs> See, I didn't forget his name this time. Carrie Otis, and of course we're joined by Miss Brooke Doherty, our executive producer. And we also have Moose the Dog in here tonight. Um hopefully he doesn't, you know. Come over here and try to eat our pizza that we baked because we baked pizza. He's been trying to grab on our pizza all night. He's Say, been taunting him. Yeah, he's been taunting me real. Well, I've no, been taunting you've been the dog. Him, mate. Yeah, <laughs> if you follow my Snapchat, you'll see me taunt my own dog. Or it's not my dog; it's my roommate's dog. But I love it. I think it's funny to torture dogs in that way. Yeah, no, he's a cruel man. I am indeed. I am indeed. So yeah, welcome. Uh, I want to say what's up to all my new subscribers on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play. Um, we want to thank you guys so much. Uh, please log on to MikeRileyNow.com and check us out on the Facebook, the Twitters, the Instagrams, all that cool stuff. Today is Thursday, December 15th, 2016, and we have had a roller coaster of a week. Uh, first of all, how was, how was finals, Charlie and Cameron? How did you guys do? Not terrible, but I'm bloody glad they're over. <laughs> Just long. Re- really long. Yeah, I remember those. Those are high school finals, too. God, wait till y'all are in college, and you got to, like... Stay up all night in your dorm room and eat ramen noodles and stuff. We have to survive high school first. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Oh, you'll survive high school just fine. I didn't survive high school, as you can as you can tell by my by my reading level. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just joking. By your name memorization yeah, skills. Yeah, my name memorization skills. Uh, did you graduate from high school? <laughs> but um, yeah, let's let's man, let's let's jump right into it. Uh, so there's so much going on in in the world right now and i i wish we had time to cover it all i mean everything from this 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 russian thing this russian hack uh that the democratic party is pushing out um you know trump recently appointed rex tillerson who is the ceo ceo of exxon mobil i I mentioned this briefly last week as a secretary of state makes you kind of scratch your head a little bit um rex tillerson is mad cool with vladimir putin and uh that just makes everybody just scratch their head about the whole Russian thing a little bit more. Now, I'm of the personal opinion that the Russian thing isn't something that the Democrats need to be kind of pushing on because it, even if they did hack the DNC and release the WikiLeaks, um, you know, n- nobody came from Russia, came and put a gun to anybody's head and made them get in the voting booth and made them vote one way or the other. I think that people, uh, you know, even though they may have been swayed, I think people have can make up their own minds. Um, once they read something, I mean, I, I read all the WikiLeaks and I still voted for Hillary Clinton. So, uh, <laughs> I really don't know. Um, but that's just a whole nother story. And then there's a big thing going on about the recount. Um, and next week we're going to try to have a guest on who's an expert in that field. So I'm going to try really hard to make that happen. But, uh, tonight I really want to kind of start off by talking about the current atmosphere that's kind of taking place. We talk about this a lot on this show about how we're kind of, sinking into this new kind of culture, this this reality show TV culture, this culture where uh, certain things are becoming normalized, like uh, the president-elect uh, tweeting, um, going into Twitter wars, for example. Um, today he got at Vanity Fair because they gave his restaurant a bad review. Uh, and, you know, he's taking pictures with Kanye West in the, in the you know, uh, lobby of Trump Trump Tower, and that's getting all these news headlines. And, uh, you know, people are really starting to succumb to this. This is becoming like the normal way our world is starting to function a little bit. Kind of like that movie Idiocracy, if you've ever seen it. There's this like, I don't know, I, I can't, the, the, the way the culture is taking place is, is starting to kind of shift a little bit. And that kind of segues me into this, this, this thing going on with fake news right now. Now, Facebook has been under a lot of scrutiny lately because... During the election, so many people were pumping out these fake news stories that people were just believing. And I think it it came down to people just wanting to believe something, whether it was true or not. A good example is this Pizzagate thing. I don't know if y'all know about this, but... um, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know all the, the details. All I know is one of, the, one of the generals that's working in Trump's cabinet, his son 
I forget the guy's name. It was the guy who said that he should we should hang Hillary or something like that. One of the hardcore ones. Smart man. Smart yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. One of the, one of the real tough guys, mm-hmm. right? He um his son got a hold of some fake news story that was posted on Twitter or Facebook or one of them that was suggesting that John Podesta, who's Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, and Hillary Clinton were running a child pornography ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington D.C. Now, this guy followed this story straight to the bank. I mean, he was just, he was into it and he thought it was a real story. Really? He really didn't like Hillary Clinton. Couldn't stand her. So he wanted it to be, he, he probably wanted it to believe it was true. Now I haven't spoken to the man personally, but that would probably be my hunch. So what he did was he loaded up his, his assault rifle, drove up to DC from North Carolina where he was from or from where, or somewhere around that area, went up in the pizza parlor, shot a few shots in the air and ran in the back looking for the child, you know, looking for the child pornography thing. Now, he's sitting in jail right now awaiting trial, but when he found out it wasn't true, he was just like, damn, you know, this type of thing is starting to kind of sway. And on the other side, a couple of weeks ago, there was a young Muslim girl, I don't know her name, from New York, she's about 18, that said she was walking through a subway, and all these Trump supporters started harassing her, and they grabbed her purse, told her to go back to her country, they pulled her her headscarf off, I forget what they, what do they call them, burqa? Hijab. Yeah, the other hijab, yeah. I told you, man, oof, high school. <laughs> <laughs> and she made that story up. That was a lie. But people ran with it. People ran with it straight to the bank. And it created this huge atmosphere of swaying things one way or the other. This fake news and the stories that people are trying to follow are, are starting to become the norm because... We are living in this world of post facts where facts just don't make a difference. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. Donald Trump lied his way through the whole damn campaign. (laughs) And everybody knew it, but nobody cared. They were quick to call Hillary Clinton a liar. But when it came to Donald Trump's lies and bullshit, oh, yeah, yeah. I just don't really understand how we go from where we were to this and 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 not to, and then and that's not to say that fake news isn't a thing. There's always been fake news, right? There's always been like supermarket tabloids, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger had an alien baby. It's all. I mean, yeah, it's always <laughs> been festering within our society, but it's never, it's never been sort of wished into existence as much as it has now. We're we're looking for reasons to hate either side. We're looking for almost a catalyst to start a war at this point with between the political parties and we'll grasp at anything we can get regardless of whether or not it's factually correct we don't care you know i think it's sad to admit but i would probably click on something that said you know donald trump turns out complete april fool's joke he's screwing the press he's not really running for you know i would click on that and i go really oh my god thank god and i would know it's not true but i wouldn't care yeah I hear, I hear you. That's yeah. that's the awful thing. It's you ignore that part of your brain that says this isn't really happening when the rest of you so desperately wants to believe that it is that I think America is starting to block out the logical side. I mean, that's kind of like the whole I want to reinforce my own beliefs thing, right? It's exactly. like I I, I want to believe something, so I'm going to turn. I mean, that's what pretty much what news is like if I'm a liberal, I'm gonna go to MSNBC or something like that, because that's reinforcing my beliefs I have about my my dislike of conservatives or dislike of Republicans. And same thing, if I'm a Republican, I'm gonna go on Fox News, regardless of the the news stories are real or not, because there have been plenty of Fox News stories that have been classically debunked, but people feed into it. It's the number one news channel all across the Rust Belt in the South, because of the fact that people want to believe these specific stories, they want to kind of reinforce those beliefs. It's selective hearing. It really is. Yeah. It's that that division that, that kind of puts us out there. And these fake news stories are, to, are starting to become the norm. They're starting to become that thing, you know, because people don't want to go to the regular media anymore to get their information. Most people are turning out CNN and MSNBC because, you know, they're behold, they're, they're, their job is to no longer report their news. Their job is to bring in viewers. Their job is to... Uh, to uh, appeal to their shareholders who own their corporations. Like, you know, Time Warner owns this one and Comcast Cable owns the other one and they're corporations. So they have to bring in ratings. So they have to get eyeballs. So they're going to give you a reality show. They're going to give you some fake news. So where do people go? They go to the internet. And Lord knows the internet is like 
the devil's playground when it comes to fake news. You know, it, I, I read this story. I don't know if it's true or not. You can fact check me on this. And I want to know what y'all think about this out there in TV land. You know, uh, I know we're not watching TV, but one day. Podcast land. Yeah, yeah com- <laughs> podcast land. Uh, comment on Facebook. Let me know what you think about this and where do you think this is kind of leading to. And I think um, something that is so scary for me, and I bet for Cameron as well, is that people our age, people that are in high school and middle school, that are highly unlikely to actually turn on the TV and go to CNN, go to Fox, go to ABC, go to any of these um, fact, generally factually correct in the broad spectrum of things, um, news channels, we go on Facebook and Instagram right. and the internet and whatever news story pops up on Snapchat that week. It's all about... Um, <laughs> easy access and big headlines that catch our eye to get to, um i don't want to say youngsters so it makes me sound like i'm 80 but to get youngsters involved <laughs> i mean you are so i am 80 I'm, at, yeah, I'm 80 at yeah, heart yeah. um you got the benjamin button thing yeah absolutely but it's it's definitely it's disconcerting it's really concerning um to think that cameron and i are in the minority of people that will actually turn on the tv and will watch cnn will watch fox um, are right. willing to like are put willing, the effort yes. into educating themselves and on the topics. Pardon my French, but willing to see through the bullshit. Right. Yeah, yeah. of course. And you were speaking English, but um, <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, no, Not but you're right. I try and use a British right. phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're absolutely right. A lot of people won't take the time to actually fact check themselves. You know, if I hear a story like some of these Alex Roberts stories, not or not Alex Roberts, Alex Jones stories that you hear sometimes, right? Something that's wrapped in this realm of conspiracy theories. If I'm going, you know, and some people really like fake news. For some people, that really is entertaining. I mean, yeah. supermarket tabloids do exist. You know, Bat Boy, I can't tell you how many times I saw that walking along. And, you know, Hillary Clinton had a, you know, hooked up with an alien and blah, blah, blah. Some people really like stuff like that. But for some people, when they hear like an uh, Alex Jones conspiracy theory, like Sandy Hook was a black flag operation that the government put together in order to take people's guns away. When people hear shit like that and they really get into it and they start to they start to subscribe to these notions because it reinforces their belief that this whatever I don't like or whatever I I want to believe kind of suits and caters me, that becomes a very dangerous atmosphere and that is starting to become our nation. And all the while this is going on, people are ignoring the bigger things. They're ignoring the actual shit that's taking place. Like how Donald Trump just appointed a climate change denier to head of the EPA. If we even have an EPA after he's done. Yeah. That's like making Bill Cosby the, the, the uh, head of uh, women's, uh, you know, <laughs> women's like rights issues It's like making Donald Trump the head of women's rights right, issues. or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's no. just... It's just, it's so counterintuitive. I don't, I just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I know. And it's so, I see it every day at school, the effects of what's happening. I mean, I, I was talking to someone uh, in one of my classes last week, or not last week, sorry, yesterday. And um, I was, they were talking to me about some stupid tabloid thing about, God, I don't know, Tiger and Kylie Jenner, uh, something oh yeah. along there. You know, the big news. Something along those, you know, really crucial stories that we need to know. And I asked them, what do you think about the situation that just happened in Aleppo? Right. And like an old what? presidential candidate, they went, what's Aleppo? <laughs> what's Aleppo? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Speaking of Aleppo, and we didn't get a chance to get into it, this, this, and I really wanted to talk about fascism and the rise of fascism. We're going to have to save that for next week. But speaking of Aleppo, and speaking of what's taking place around the world, there is while while we're kind of kind of succumbing to this reality TV culture, which I promise you is going to take place. You know, Kanye West has a good chance of becoming president now. Speaking of Tyga and Tyga Kylie Jenner, yeah. they may be up in the White House pretty soon. <laughs> but on the flip side of things, there is this rise of fascism. Now, I'm not going to start getting all you know. Oh my God, the, the Hitler Nazi Germany thing on you. I'm not really down with those conversations, but history does repeat itself. There's this website out right now that uh, I heard Rush Limbaugh talking about, and it is called um, it's called ProfessorWatchlist.org. And the goal of the website is to out liberal college professors who speak out against Trump and the things that he's doing. The same thing happened at Orange Coast College a couple weeks ago. 
this is starting to become this norm, something that we need to watch out for. All right, y'all, we are coming up against the break. This is the Mike Riley Now podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. We'll be right back. You are listening to the Mike Riley Now podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. Follow us by visiting MikeRileyNow.com. All right, all right, y'all, and welcome back to the Mike Riley Now podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. Um, this is our second segment of the, or it's our news of the week. And I know a lot of y'all come to me, not to me, but to us. I am so narcissistic. <laughs> How dare you? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> y'all, you, everybody comes to me to get their news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I go to Brooke Dockerty to get all my news and she just passes it down to me. So y'all need to thank Brooke. Don't thank me. Brooke's acting like she don't hear me back there. All right. <laughs> She's so modest. All right. Let's start it out. Uh, my first news story is kind of a. It's kind of a crazy one. This one came from the Wall Street Journal. It was dated back on December 11th. Um, it says that automation can actually create more jobs. Evidence shows increased productivity leads to more wealth, cheaper goods, greater spending power, and ultimately more jobs. Is that so? Um, since the since the 1970s, this is this is from the story. It was written by Chris Christopher Mims. Since the 1970s, when automated teller machines arrived, the number of bank tellers in America has more than doubled. James Basin, an economist who teaches at Boston University School of Law, points to that points to that seeming paradox amid new concerns that automation is stealing human jobs. To the contrary, he says, jobs and automation often go hand in hand. I call bullshit. Complete bullshit. I when I walk in the bank, I see about four tellers maybe and like three people working behind the desk. I personally don't think automation is going to create more jobs at all. I think it's actually going to take jobs away. <laughs> maybe there may be a, a there, there could be some sort of industry that comes from programming robots or something like that. But I don't really know if Amazon or if, if automation is really going to sustain uh, is, is, you know, a, a level of of job growth to where humans need it. Because, we, you know, you can't really have a supply based economy. You know, you need a demand based economy. You know, you can't have a whole bunch of stuff to, to sell if nobody can buy it. And if people don't have jobs, they're not going to have money to buy things. Yeah. And I think um from the perspective of possibly gaining new jobs, like you said, creating and manufacturing the robots, that's more of a specialized thing. No one can just walk off the street right. and be like, I'll build the robot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or like, I know how to work. Yeah. The I know how to ro- work a robot. That takes, you know, a college degree in. Um, or, yeah. It takes a skill just having well, to understand robotics and software. Yeah, exactly. Which in people general. don't have. It's definitely, I think, will become much more intertwined in like your initial education as, sure. like as time goes on but like right now there there are not many people that have the skill set to control these or to understand how they work and not to mention i mean you know if a, uh, most corporations think like corporations do these have you guys heard about these amazon go stores yeah yeah the, the, the actually the, the the article goes on to read the threat that machines pose to workers in the news again after an election that turned out in the first frust- turn on the frustration of working class voters last week amazon.com inc introduced amazon go a store without cashiers that's creating more jobs <laughs> A store without cashiers. So what, you know, and soon they're going to, you know, you're not going to need people that need to clean the store because the robot's going to go. And and corporations have this thing where, you know, this goes back to the beginning of time. You want to if you start a company, you want to cut you want to you want to save a lot of money and make the most money you can cut your labor cost. That's why slavery, you know, thrived for centuries, because if you ain't got to pay people, that's why that's why a lot of big corporate interests hate labor unions <clears throat> republicans that's why they hate labor unions because you know they you know they don't want people to have those same rights and to be able to pay them as much as they're as much as they need to be paid to have a livable wage so i mean you know cut your labor costs so i don't know i call i think that one's a little bit up in the yeah. air and i i think um something that goes along with it is just that we So, like you said, slavery worked so well because it was Mm -hmm. the easiest way to be successful was to not pay anybody. And I know that we are moving along in this um, electronic world and this automated um, new society that we're going into because we can. Right. But we're not really questioning 
if we should, should. Yeah. <laughs> because we're getting to the point where yes cool so robots can do this so the robots could wipe that your ass if you wanted them to but that means that you can't anymore it's this it's the situation of the more we have the chance to do this the less we're taking away of humanity's opportunities to make a living, a human living. Right. And then what are we going to do when that happens? Yeah. Have you heard of this, this IBM Watson robot? This robot is like super smart. It can, it, it, it gets updated on cancer research every single day. So it knows more about Jeez. cancer research. It knows more about can you know, this is the, the same computer that like beat the best chess player in the right, world right. or something like that. And it, it, it's getting to the point where, you know, you know, doctors, surgery, Lawyers, things like, not lawyers, maybe not lawyers, but I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, Siri is only going to become more advanced. One of these days, you know, we're going to be talking about, remember the first Siri? And, you know, all you did was ask it, Siri, you know, how many eggs should I put in my eggs Benedict? And now Siri it reads like, your mind. Yeah, now it's like, how you want your eggs Benedict cooked? I got you. You know, I'll yeah. go over there and do it for you. <laughs> it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to take the place if we put some personality in it. But anyway, uh, I, I think, want eggs Benedict now. Yeah, no, eggs Benedict or some sort of egg something or another. Turn right? the lights you know, off. Right, yeah, <laughs> the, the, only the rich are going to have the really cool robots. Um, this next story, uh, actually, I want to kind of dig into this this one right here uh, and talk about what happened in Ohio this week with John Kasich. Um, John Kasich, Ohio Governor John Kasich, signs a 20-week uh, bill. Oops, uh, sorry. Let me go back here. Okay, this is according to NPR. Uh, this was just dated December 13th. Ohio uh, Governor John Kasich signs a 20-week abortion limit and rejects the heartbeat bill. So uh, essentially, uh, Ohio Governor John Kasich signed a 20-week gestation limit, I hope I said that word right, for abortions into law Tuesday while separately vetoing a measure that would have banned abortions after a fetal heartbeat um, is uh, detectable. The so-called heartbeat bill, which Kasich rejected, was considered more vulnerable to a legal challenge. So essentially, um, what John Kasich basically signed into law was... uh, at, is it basically at 20 weeks is when you're able to terminate your pregnancy still, right? Or or is it after six weeks? Well, the, um, the heartbeat bill was six weeks. The heartbeat, the heartbeat bill, bill was six, six weeks. weeks. So he extended it to 20 weeks. Okay. Great. I yeah. mean, better than nothing, but oh my God. Yeah, it's kind of like a... um. I mean, in, in, in 20 weeks, that's about... That's not... You're still in your first trimester at 20 weeks. 20 weeks, you're at about the... Four and a half, five month point. So you're just entering your second trimester. You're just entering your second it, trimester. It, it's it's much better than the heartbeat bill or whatever. Yes. Right. Because the heartbeat bill was literally six weeks, and most people don't even know they're pregnant by At that six time. Weeks. So yeah. six yeah. weeks. Yeah. So that's not. It's really... like, are you like, are you kidding me? Congrats, um, you're pregnant. Oops, sorry, can't get. It. <laughs> right. Right. Well, at least he didn't ban him outright. Yeah. Um. You know, and 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 we had this talk a couple of weeks ago about the young lady who who tried who decided to terminate her own pregnancy, um, and uh, I put this stories up on MikeRallyNow dot com. So y'all put you know go on there, comment on them, uh, let me know what you think. But um, yeah, I you know t- t- taking steps in this direction and hopefully Roe v versus Wade doesn't get overturned pretty soon is 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 starting to you know this is always going to be a hot topic issue. I feel at some point. But I think it just kind of always goes back to, you know, yeah, I can see how a lot of people kind of consider it murder. But at the same time, I think we got to really consider the the welfare and the sanctity of the person who's involved, the mother, for the most part. I also want to make a quick point is that the we also have to think beyond just like the immediate because our population is incredibly large. And if we let everyone have every single baby that they get pregnant with we're gonna have a really big population problem even bigger than we have right now because we have a massively large one right now that and you know people we need to have some better education in our school system when it comes to sexual education and you know and things like that because i think that's one of the reasons why we have out of control teen pregnancy rates why we have unwanted pregnancies why people you know, because we get taught this idea, yeah, especially when we're young. I remember when I was taking sexual education, when I was coming up, the only thing I learned about sex in school was this is how you get an STD and this is what happens when you get pregnant. So you never wanted that to happen. And it was just a lot of scaring people into abstinence, which obviously didn't work for any of us growing up in high school. Hmm. So, I, I mean, you know, I don't really know what 
what the, the I, th- I think there's better solutions to this, but yeah. I really do think that if you want to to find a way to stop abortions, then you got to figure out a way to educate your populace on on making better decisions and making better sexual decisions for their life versus just kind of saying, oh, leave that up to the parents or leave it up to whoever else the case may be. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Could oftentimes. not agree more. So uh, agree you know, more. you you really have to put this. You have to implement this into the school system in order for people to get a. Uh, uh, especially you know young women in order for them to understand their bodies and understand you know what they're going through and understand their minds and understand their emotions to the point where you know they can make better decisions and they can have children when they're ready it's Um, so crucial it really is and it's i mean i could honestly talk someone's ear off about this because i'm very passionate about this um topic but it's essentially um it's a known fact that women that have in the break here but okay women that have more rights will not have as many pregnancies right. it's just a fact and if we do not educate women on this subject if we do not allow them this education then we have no chance whatsoever at ever making full progress um in not only population but abortions and all of this right i agree i completely agree well we we have to just keep working on that progress so we'll see what happens. All right, y'all, we're hitting the break. We'll be right back. Mike Riley Now Podcast. You are listening to the Mike Riley Now Podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. Follow us by visiting MikeRileyNow.com. All right, y'all, and welcome back to the Mike Riley Now Podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. I'm your host, Mike Riley, who you've been listening to this whole time. And if you are still riding with us, thank you so much. God bless you. This is the third segment of our show. It's our economics portion of our show. Uh, make sure you log on to MikeRileyNow.com and uh, do all the Facebook, Twitters, and all that stuff. And tell all your friends about the show. Have them subscribe. I'm on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, working on iHeartRadio. Um, I'm on SoundCloud, too, and everything else like that. So, yeah. Um, I really want to start this third segment out by talking about... Well, first of all, let's talk about what's what's, what's kind of taking place in our own government, right? So... Basically, this, there's this thing that happened with, with, with we all we, we talked about the carrier thing. Right. And we talked about how the school system, um, how uh, the, the Betsy DeVoe, how she wants to privatize our school system. Basically, we're, we're, we're kind of transforming into this system of this idea of Reaganomics where corporations are kind of running our government. In other words, we're getting what's called an oligarchy. And for those of you who don't know what, all, what, what an oligarchy is, an oligarchy is a system of government where the rich few kind of pull the strings and control everything, right? And in this case, it would it would be the corporations. And they really want to take things away from people. They really, not take things away. I'm not saying that they like sit in a room smoking cigars and they're like, ah, ha, ha, screw those poor people <laughs> or whatever. What should you we know. take next? Yeah, but they have this idea that anything that they can make a dollar off of, they are going to do it. It's like skimming a casino, you know? If I'm going to make a buck off of it, I'm going to make a buck off of it. If I can make a profit off of it, I'm going to make a profit off of it. That's kind of like what healthcare is, right? That's what this idea of this, like, you know, and I'm not bad-mouthing private industry. Private industry is, is, is great if we can make it thrive. But in certain areas where private industry really doesn't pick up, especially things that are for the commons, you have these people kind of coming in trying to take over. And... I kind of want to point to this speech that was given by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I kind of came across this uh, not too long ago, and it was given at the Commonwealth Club on um, uh, September 23rd, 1932 in San Francisco. This is a really, really famous speech, although the audio or video of it doesn't exist. Have you heard this speech before? Um, I've heard chunks of it in certain moments, and I think it's powerful, yeah, really. It's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant speech. I don't know if you'd be able to give the same speech today, kind of given our current situation yeah the tone of our of our current electorate but um i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of read you portions of the speech and in this in this speech he was he was he's pointing out how this corporate corporization corporatization of our government is 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 going is 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 what's leading our country down the wrong direction now keep in mind this is in 1932 before he became president he got elected in november so this is right before he got elected and this is right at the height of the great depression I'm going to kind of paraphrase and skip around here, but what he says, the issue of government has always been whether individual men and women will have to serve some system of government of economics or whether a system of government and economics exists to serve individual men and women. 
The question has persistently dominated the discussion of government for many generations. One question relating to these things men have deferred, and from time immemorial, it is probable that honest men will continue to differ. In other words, we're going to continue to fight over this idea of big business versus big government. It's always been kind of like this struggle. I mean, it's it's been there throughout history, you know, since we... Um first saw major corporations come up you know andrew carnegie steel and um big oil all these companies that suddenly started popping up in the late 19th century um we we have almost stumbled into what could be um a a monopoly of america essentially you know it's it's major large companies controlling every other aspect of it it's a horizontal integration and it's yeah and, and it stifles small business absolutely it complete and it small business is something that we run off of it's something that um has always been part of the american dream is that you can come and you can start your own business right. and you can be a self-made man and all of this you know that came since the industrial revolution with um um i think benjamin franklin himself said i am a self-made man you know he wrote right. about that in his autobiography um and it's just this idea that that american ideal and that american dream is getting crushed by this monopoly of our country of our economic system of our government in 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 just to kind of piggyback off what you just said right there charlie our country was kind of founded in this idea of taking down big corporations who try to stifle out the little guy i mean think about the boston tea party a lot of people don't really know the whole story of the boston tea party as far as they're concerned a bunch of colonists dressed up like indians went in the in the on the ship and just dumped the tea in the harbor but they don't really know the reason why the reason why was because the british is the british east india company who was in league with the 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 monarchies of Europe, you know, King George and all the rest of them. They all had stock in this business and they were shipping all their tea to the colonies. And basically they passed they passed the, the you know the the tea act, which was that that tax where they taxed all of the colonists who had these like little mom and pop tea shops all along the colonies where people used to go and get their tea and they would buy their tea at a, a you know at a reasonable price. Well, basically what happened was the parliament or whoever was running Europe at the time, they oh. cut yeah, they cut taxes on the British, British East India Company's tea because it was like the king's tea or something like that. And it drove their prices down and pretty much stifled all the rest of the competition for the small independent tea companies because it was a big corporation that wanted to run the tea game and monopolize it. So what they do, they dress up like Indians and they dump the equivalent of today would be millions of dollars worth of tea into the Boston Harbor. That would be, is it Moose? Moose. Moose. I don't know. Mo- Moose thing. is angry about this. Yeah, <laughs> pissed off. <laughs> But um, he's emotionally distraught. Yes, yes, emotionally distraught about this whole thing. But th- 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 that was the first kind of act of corporate vandalism that sparked. That was one of the things that sparked the American Revolution was stifling out this little guy. Yeah. I mean, our, our nation is founded on this very ideal that um, no one thing should control every other aspect of everyone's life. Right, and that's why we created. You know, government by the people for the people was so that we wouldn't have this one monarchical, um, over controlled person yeah, <laughs> running exactly. over us, you know. Yeah. And, um, whether that person is a monarch or a company or a corporation, yes. yeah, exactly. It's no different, it's they're interchangeable nowadays. It's, it's basically just this new age. 21st century way of saying an overrule monarch, right? From just a corporate standpoint. And a lot of uh, libertarians and conservative friends and a lot of liberals, too, kind of had this idea of taking the government out of business. Um, And, you know, this Ayn Rand theory. uh, It's funny because Paul Ryan, uh, our speaker of the House, used to make every single one of his employees read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged uh, before they worked for him. And uh, somebody outed him and he made him stop doing that. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) Uh, essentially this idea of keeping the government out of business and so the business would thrive. And, you know, you know, what is the purpose of government and what is the purpose of, of an economy? How can you have an economy run naturally? Like it's some sort of natural entity that, that comes about naturally like water flowing or, or, or something like that. You know, governments create economies. It's not the other way around. Exactly. Governments are the ones who create economies. Governments print money. They make all the rules. They make all the regulations so that an economy can run. An economy is, is put there to serve the people, much like a government is put there to serve the people. They're, they're, they're meant to serve the people. So in that sense, and I know this pisses a lot of people off when they, when, I hear, when they hear me say this, 
but you technically don't have the right to start a business. That is a privilege that's allotted to you by the people, by the government. Now, I know that's a, a kind of a crappy thing to hear, but at the end of the day, you are the government. It's a government by the people and for the people. So therefore, people just can't, they don't have a right to make a buck any way they feel like it. Let me go ahead and, and continue on with, with this FDR speech. FDR goes on to say, and I'm, I'm skipping around a lot here, because in the speech he talks a lot about like Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt in the beginning days, how they were the ones who busted up the big companies. They're the ones who busted up. They had the trust busting. That's what Teddy Roosevelt did. And Woodrow Wilson kind of, he built on that. And he was uh, uh, the one who was, who, was br- who, who was starting to break up all of these big you know, monopolies and corporations like the guys who came in, like the Rockefellers and stuff like that, who were trying to control things through monopolies and trying to stifle out small business, trying to or, or choke out the small business, except for, you know, World War One happened. And that really threw Woodrow Wilson off because he had to stop focusing his attention on domestic issues and focus atten- his attention on the big war that was going on in Europe. And uh, FDR mentions that in this in this speech. And he also talks about Thomas Jefferson and everything else like that. But to kind of skip around, he says the same man who tells you that he does not want to see the government interfere in business, and he means it, has plenty of good reasons for saying it. So is the first to go to Washington and ask the government for a, pro- for a pro- prohibitory tariff on his product. When things get just bad enough as they did two years ago, he will go with equal speed to the United States government and ask for a loan, and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is the outcome of it. Each group has sought protection from the government for its own special interests without realizing that the function of government must be to favor no small group at the expense of its duty to protect the rights of personal freedom and private property of all of its citizens. In other words, whenever these so-called people who hate the government can't stand the government, want the government out of their business, doesn't want the government interfering with anything, what happens when, you know, what ultimately happens when capitalism comes into play? Not any kind of capitalism, but free market capitalism, crony capitalism, direct, unregulated capitalism. When the when the, the market crashes, who do they go to for that loan? The government. It's kind of like that one kid who says, I hate you, mom, but give can me... Can I a, have 50 bucks? Yeah, can I have 50 bucks? Yeah, you know, fuck you, mom, but can I have some money to go shopping? Exactly. You know, that, that, that whole kind of... Attitude. Biting the hand that feeds you. You know, what happened when the economy crashed you know, a couple of years ago, back in 2008. First of all, why did it crash? It crashed because of deregulation. Who crashed it? Same people we're talking about now. Who they run to when they needed a bailout? You and me. We had to pay for it. And that's something that FDR talks about here in the speech. He goes on to say, hold on, let me skip around here. Recently, a uh, and this is and, and, and he's talking about uh, uh, how cor- how the corporation and the concentration of business and the concentration of wealth in the in the few is a bad idea. Recently, a careful study was made of the concentration of business in the United States. It showed that our economic life was dominated by some six hundred odd corporations who controlled two thirds of the American industry. Ten million small businessmen divided the other third. More striking still, it appeared that if the process of concentration goes on at the same rate at the end of the higher at, at the end of the, another century we shall have an all american industry controlled by a dozen corporations and run perhaps by a hundred men but plainly we are steering a steady course towards economic oligarchy if we are not there already and this is the same thing that's happening today well put <laughs> <laughs> Literally the same thing that's happening today. Economic oligarchy. That's where we're on our way to. FDR goes on to say, Just as in olden, older times, the central government was the first haven of refuge, and then a threat so now in a closer economic system, the central and ambitious financial unit is no longer a servant of a national desire, but a danger. Essentially, he's saying, you know, governments first came together because people sought refuge. They would come together in communities to protect themselves from all the wiles and things that were going on. And, you know, you had that king, that leader who, uh, who had to take on the burden of serving the people. And, uh, that, that, that wasn't necessarily a great job to have back then, but, um, that's pretty much what took place. Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, every man has the right to life. And, and, and then just to kind of piggyback off of that, he goes on to say how people, 
uh, how people became dark and how people became greedy and they started to use that power that they were having for their own economic insight and for their own special interest. People just don't talk like that anymore. No. What well, you mean like FDR in this speech? Yeah. No, absolutely it's not. So Donald sad. Trump can never give up and give a speech like this today. People it would go right over people's heads. It's tragic this is, that uh, we, we've this is lost what this, this is what this is what FDR got elected off of. Yes, absolutely. And I think this I, and I think, to be honest, it's one of the reasons that Obama got elected was he was such a fantastic speaker. Right. He, yeah. he just, he connected with everyone. And it's just, it's so sad that um, apart from the topic of the speech, just the language and the way that it was spoken is so unheard of in these days. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, just it, look it, at it, what yeah. our present elect is saying compared to something like this. This is composed. This is honest. This is... Um, brilliant for all other words yeah. considered, and yeah. it's we've just lost it somewhere along the way. Yeah, we're kind of uh, devolving, devolving. If you yeah, know. we're devolving. We're devolving. You know, there's a lot more information out there, but we're not. You know, but we're getting fake news. We're not not really using it. Bloody brain dead. Yeah. Um, Bunch of steps backwards. A couple steps backwards. Idiocracy, one of the greatest movies of all time. Quote film, Mike Judge. Um, <laughs> it goes on to say that uh, every man has a right to life. This is FDR. And this means that he has also has a right to make a comfortable living. He may, by sloth or crime, decline to exercise that right, but it may not be denied him. We have no actual famine or death. Our industrial and agricultural mechanism can produce enough and to spare. Our government, formal and informal, political and economic, owes to everyone on avenue to possess himself of a portion that a plenty sufficient of his needs through his own work. In other words, everyone has a right to work. Everyone has a right to make a decent living. That's a human right. And I want to end this uh, with a quote from my man, uh, Ike Eisenhower. Ike Eisenhower once said, should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm, farm programs, you would not hear of that political party again in our political history. There is a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes that you can do these things. Among them are the Texas oil millionaires, an occasional politi politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is neg negligible and they are stupid. In other words, taking over our government the people who try to do that and take benefits away, benefits away from people are stupid and negligent. To put it bluntly, yeah. To put it bluntly. <laughs> All right, y'all. That is our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you log on to MikeRileyNow.com and subscribe. God bless Charlie. God bless Cameron. God bless Brooke. God bless my man. Uh, oh, Casey. Casey, yeah, over there. <laughs> and God bless all of y'all, too. Remember, y'all, get involved, get informed now. Democracy is not a spectator sport. We have to get involved. We have to get informed. We have to get involved. We're all in this together. All right, y'all, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Can't believe I forgot your name. You are listening to the Mike Riley Now podcast on the Young Angels of America Network. Follow us by visiting Mike Riley Now.